is about Solomon, his, his son. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. This, the second part is not Solomon's kingdom established forever, because we know that ends in about 400 years. But, right? no, about, yeah, yeah, about 400 years. And I will establish the throne of his, going back to the his kingdom in verse 12, forever. And I promise you that's going to happen. Jesus Christ will live and reign on this earth for a thousand years. And then in heaven we will call him King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. This is the verse where it's promised. Verse 16, And thy house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. Thou love David's. Oh, well, let me read this. According to all these words, David, these words, according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. Then went, David, then went King David in and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I, O Lord? Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that thou hast brought me hither to? He has the right attitude. He's not like Saul full of pride. But Lord, who am I, just uh, the son of Jesse, that you would cause to be the king and then establish a permanent kingdom? And by the way, for you Bible students, you know this. That in the millennial kingdom, <laughs> Jesus Christ will rule the world with a rod of iron. and There'll be peace on the earth finally. The, 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 uh, the swords will be beat into plowshares and that, all that stuff. But don't forget who it says, and King David, resurrected from the dead with a glorified body like you and I will have, will be the over all of Jerusalem. <laughs> and Christ will rule from Jerusalem, but just like now you have a president in, in Jerusalem or a prime minister, and then you have a mayor of Jerusalem. The mayor of Jerusalem is none other than David himself named by the book of Ezekiel. And that's something that's pretty cool, isn't it? So, all right, so that's the, the main theme of the book. But I, I went back in my study Bible, and I just want to point out the five, you don't have to take notes of this, but the five covenants through the Bible that, that bring us up to this. First covenant was Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. After mankind had sinned, what we call the proto-evangelical, God promised Eve that through your seed, see women don't have a seed, but God says to Eve, through your seed mankind will be saved. That's why when Cain was born they said, we have the man. <laughs> they didn't realize it was going to be thousands and thousands of years before that would prophecy be fulfilled. And then in Genesis chapter 9, God promises to Shem, Noah's son, through your descendants, not through your brother's descendants, will the Savior of the world come. Then, chapter 13 of the book of Genesis, God says to Abraham, Abraham, I have called you out of Ur of the Chaldeans through thy seed. So he said, starts out with all of mankind, Eve, then the, just the family of Shem, then the family of of Abraham. Through Abraham the Savior will come. Why wow, that's something. But then if you keep going on in the book of Genesis chapter 49 when, when Jacob is leaning on his staff ready to die he says through Judah the scepter will never be removed from Israel. So we know now not just through Abraham but through Abraham's grandson Judah great grandson Judah the Savior will come and now we know David who's from the tribe of Judah the royal tribe now we know that it will come through the seed of David so God keeps narrowing it down and then of course we're on this side of it we know who he is his name is Jesus hallelujah all of it's been fulfilled all right that's a little background so let's uh let's get into this right here now it came to pass after the death of Saul David doesn't even know this. David doesn't even know that Saul was dead. Because remember, David had spent the last several months, the last 16 months with the Philistines. And then through God's mercy, as we end the book of 1 Samuel, the Philistines say, Achish says, I want you to go and we're going to fight against Israel. And so David goes. I don't know what's going to happen, but God does. And before the battle, the other kings of the Philistines say, he's not going to battle with us. Right in the middle of battle, he'll change allegiance and fight against us. Send him and all his men home. Thank God. That's God's mercy. David never had to lift up his hand 
against Saul. And that's God's mercy on him. Plus, David didn't know that by the time he makes a three-day journey back, the battle's getting ready to start. It's not start, it won't start until David actually gets back these days later. When David gets back, that all of Ziglag, where he and all of his men and all their families, about 1,500 counting the men and the children and the women, have been living, have been carried away by the Amalekites. And remember the story how that David chases after them, him and his men. Some of the men are so tired after traveling that, this, they have to be left beside the river. And some of the other men go on, they find an Egyptian that they cast off ready to die. And David, through his kindness, talks to him and says, if you'll show us where the camp is, where they've got our wives and children, then you'll be fine. You'll be free. You can live. And so he does, and God gives them a victory. They not only get back all their wives and their children, they take them back to great spoil. And you know, you remember that story. So, so David, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, and David has had abode two days in Ziglag, so they're back, and it, it, they burnt Ziglag, but remember it's made mostly out of clay and mud, so it wouldn't have burnt like our homes might, okay? It came to pass, it came. It came even to pass on the third day, now this is the third day, the third day that he's back in Ziglag, that behold, a man came out of the camp from, from Saul with his clothes rent and earth upon his head. And so it was when he came to David that he fell to the earth and did obeisance. He said, you're my king, you know, I love you, all these things. And so David said unto him, from whence comest thou? He said unto him, out of the camp of Israel am I escaped. Now what we're about to hear here is recorded in God's word. It's a true account of what this man says. But this man is lying, okay? Because we already know what happened to King Saul. We already read it back in 1 Samuel several months ago. Saul was wounded in the battle from the archers. He's leaning on his spear. He goes to his young armor bearer that would never leave the king's side and says, kill me. The armor bearer said, I'm not going to kill the king. He said, but I, you have to kill me because I'm going to die and I don't want these Philistines to torture me. You remember. And so the armor bearer won't kill him. So Saul falls on his own sword and he knows how to place the sword. He's a warrior and he kills himself. And then when the armor bearer comes over and they know a lot about death, a lot more than I would know about death. They've killed and been around many dead bodies. When the armor bearer saw that he was dead, he took his own life. Now that's what happened. But here's what this guy says happened. From whence comest thou? And he said, Out of the camp of, of Israel am I escaped. And David said unto him, How went the matter? I pray thee, tell me. And he answered, That the people are fled from the battle. Many of the people are fallen and dead. And, John, and Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead also. Actually, all the sons that went to battle with Saul were all dead. All the ones that went to battle were dead. And Saul's sons, including Jonathan, his, his eldest son. And David said unto the young man that told him, How knowest thou that Saul and Jonathan, his son, be dead? And the young man told him, that told him, said, As I happened by chance, okay, first off, this first lie, he didn't go by chance to the mountain Gaboa. He went there on purpose because he went there to try to get ahead of the Philistine army. He went there as a peaceful person, maybe mixed in with Israel's army, to steal whatever he could steal from the battlefield, to loot the battlefield before the Philistines got there. But I happened by chance upon Mount Gaboa, and behold, Saul leaned on his spear. He was standing up. And lo, the chariots and the horsemen followed hard after him. And when he looked behind him, he saw me. And he called unto me, and I answered, Here am I. Oh, he's, you know, he's, the, he's going to be the hero of his own story. Isn't he? he's, going to, he's just going to build himself up here. He's going to get him a big old reward from King David. Everything's going to go his way. This is going to be a great day for this young man. Here am I. And he said unto me, Who art thou? And I answered him, I am an Amalekite. Now, I'll get to that in when we get over to verse, uh, let's see, another place where we get to verse 13. So we'll deal with them being Amalekite then, okay? And remember, because that's who just stole David's family, all these men's family. So I bet when he said, I'm an Amalekite, they all went, 
you know, like they, they, they just killed a bunch of Amalekites and got their families back. They're, they're not happy to meet an Amalekite. But he doesn't know any of this. And he said, this is King Saul, said unto me again, Stand, I pray thee, upon me, and slay me, for anguish upon me, because my life is yet whole in me. Saul's so leaning on his spear. They would have a, they would sharpen up the back end of the spear, not like to a point, but they could stand in the ground. Remember, we are seeing this. Saul had his spear in the ground, so everybody know where he was at in that one battle and, and, the, and the jug of water there that night. Okay, so you know, so he's leaning on his spear. He's been wounded, but my life is still in me. So I stood upon him and slew him because I was sure that he could not live after that he was fallen. Now here's what he's getting at. And I took the crown. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That was upon his head and the bracelet, the king's bracelet that many kings in the east wore at that time. That was on his arm. And it brought them hither and to my Lord. And David did not respond like he thought he would. David took hold of his clothes and rent them. Likewise, all the men were th with him. And they mourned and wept and fastened them to evening for Saul and for Jonathan his son. And for the people, all their, think how many friends and family these men had that they don't know, were they among the dead that died just three days ago in the battle? Are they, are they dead now? You know, we know Saul's dead. We know that Jonathan's dead. But, but there are many, he said, many of the people have fallen for the house of Israel because they were fallen by the sword. Now let's stop right here. This young man thinks one thing's going to happen, but it doesn't happen. Instead of saving David saying, yay, Saul's dead. David doesn't do that. Saul says, I mean, David says, mourning and weeping. He, he screams out loud and tears his clothes. And, 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 and he doesn't say, but I'm sure because they always did, they would put dust on their head as a sign of mourning. And he says that he did this. And all the men then did the same thing that were with him till the evening. They didn't eat that day. Hmm. I have a feeling that this young man had told the truth to King David. It would have turned out good for him. I have a feeling that he would have said, I came upon the battlefield and I saw the king was dead and I stole the crown and the bracelet and I've traveled all the... This would, be, this would be 90 some miles, somewhere between 90 and 100 miles. And he's made it this way. So he's been traveling almost nonstop, night and day, to make it in three days. And so he's traveled this distance and if he'd someone said... I'm sorry to tell you King Saul is dead and Jonathan's dead, but I did rescue these from the battlefield. I'm sure in spite of him being an Amalekite, David would have not let his men kill him and would have been very kind to him. But that's not what he does. He says, I killed Saul and I took this. Now, we know for a fact, how many times do we know that David had a chance to kill Saul? Three? Three? Two, two that I can think of, you might be right in, but the two that I can think of right offhand, one in the cave of Adullam, and once when the, the, they, they, all the men were surrounding Saul, and David said, I'm going to go down there, and uh, he said, he'll go with me. And, uh, let's see, what was his name? I got it. Yeah, yeah. And Abishai, his nephew, said, I'll go with you. Man, that's a brave young guy, isn't it? I'll go with you, Uncle David. They go in and then Ab Abishai says, let me kill him right now. You'd like to kill him. Let me kill him. Not, you want to, you don't, I know you don't want to kill him. Oh, let me kill him. There's, but we're out in the middle of a camp here. And, you know, and they just take his water jug, remember, and don't kill him, you know. And then David screams back and says, hey, Abner. Hey, little old Abner. Ain't you supposed to be taking care of King Saul? What's going on in your camp tonight? And Abner wakes up, of course, as a great man of war. And he's embarrassed by David because David has come in, him and his nephew, and stood right over top of King Saul again. But anyhow, and, and maybe another time, man, that's just two that I remember right off. So he's had two or three times he could have killed King Saul, and he just wouldn't have. Now, hours have passed now. Verse 13. David said to the young man, the evening has come. They, they wept and fasted until evening. David said unto the young man that told him, Whence art thou? And he answered, I am a son of a stranger. Now, when he says son of a stranger, that means I'm not a Jew. 
But I have lived peaceably among the Jewish nation for many years. I lived there. To be a stranger, you would have lived there and your parents would have lived there. So he said, I may not be a Jew, but I've been in your culture for at least two generations. Okay, And maybe that's why he was traveling with Saul's army. I don't know. But I'm an Amalekite. Now, I'm going to stop right here and talk a little bit about that. He is an Amalekite. About 20 years before this, this is actually Saul's downfall. About 20 years before this, Samuel, you're shaking your head, Jeremy, you remember this story. Yeah. Samuel has said to King Saul, I want you to go and kill all the Amalekites. Leave no children alive, leave no cattle alive, leave no sheep, no camels, nothing. Because when the children of Israel were traveling hundreds of years before this, traveling out of Egypt, the Amalekites attacked the weak and the elderly that were at the back of the at the back of the two million some Jews that were traveling and killed them mercilessly and stole their stuff. And God said in Exodus chapter 17, someday, he says to Moses, I will destroy every Amalekite and they will be removed from the face of the earth. He gave them hundreds of years to repent. Now the time has come. God has told Saul to do that. But when Samuel gets there to the camp after the great battle, you remember the famous words, what is the bleeding of the sheep that I hear in my ears? And Saul says, oh, wait, 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 wait a second now. Wait a second now, Samuel. Don't be mad, don't be mad, don't be mad. I kept some of the good animals to offer as a sacrifice to God. We read about this in, earlier in, in 1 Samuel. Aren't you happy with No, I'm not happy with you. I told you to kill them all. Well, I did keep the king and some of the royalty alive too. So he turns around to Saul and he says, God is not pleased with you. The kingdom is going to be taken from you. And then Saul grabs a hold of the old, Samuel's an old man at this, grabs a hold of his coat and Samuel's walking away and rips it. And Samuel turns around and says, this is where, comes, this is where the phrase comes from. I will tear the kingdom from you, Saul. You will no longer be king. And he went and mourned for Saul for months, and that's when, months after this happened, God says to him, go anoint me a new king. And that's when David, as a little boy, somewhere between the ages of 10 and 14 years old, was anointed king of Israel. So anyhow, don't you think it's strange that it's an Amalekite that's taking credit for his death? The very ones that God told Saul to wipe out of the face of the earth. And, and I don't know how many messages in my life I've heard about this. So I'm going to just share you a little outline here. The Amalekites in the Bible are a picture of our flesh as Christians. You say how? Well, they attack the tired and the weak. That's what our flesh does. We think we're getting victory over some sin in our life. And when our mind and our spirits are down, old flesh attacks us. The, the Amalekites <laughs> did not fear God and wanted nothing to do with God. Neither does our flesh. But God promises one day that he will completely eradicate the Amalekites. And someday, you be sure of this, we can all take joy in this. The struggles we have with the flesh today, we will no longer have. Amen. We'll get a glorified body and we won't struggle with this old fleshly body anymore and sin that so easily comes against us. And then if you go forward in history a few more hundred years, you're in the book of Esther. You remember Haman, the one that, wanted to, that got the king that said, well, exterminate, he was the first Adolf Hitler to exterminate all of the Jews. Well, I should say the second because, of course, the Pharaoh tried to kill all, all the male boys, which would eventually would have killed the nation. He was an Amalekite. The Amalekite just keeps appearing in the Bible. Today, there are no Amalekites. They were finally wiped out by King well, I should say they were, they were almost completely wiped out by King David. Only a few families were left. And then in Persia, they were completely wiped out from the face of the earth. So anyhow, all right, so this Amalekite's taking this credit. And David said to them, How wast thou not afraid to stretch forth thine hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? He's not expect, he probably expected, well, David put the dust on his head. He's mourning. I bet. After, yeah, if things calm down, he had to make a public show. He's going to meet me behind the tent and give me a bunch of gold and silver and send me on my way. That's what's going to happen. David loved Saul. 
David did not want Saul dead. David knew that in God's time, God would take, since God made Saul king and God made David king, David knew that someday God would correct it. And it wasn't his place to do it. He would never lift his hand against God's anointed. David said, how unto him, how what? How was thou not afraid to stretch forth thine hand to destroy the Lord's anointing? And David called one of the young men and said, Go near, fall upon him. And he smote him that he died. Not exactly the reward he was looking for, was it? Be not mocked. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man sows, that shall he also reap. If you sow things, lies, destruction, trying to get ahead by your lies, you may not die for it immediately, but it'll cause a death in your soul. I promise you that. Start eating away at you like a cancer. And David said unto him, Thy blood be upon thy head, for thy mouth is testified against thee, saying, I have slain the Lord's anointing. Now, verse 17 to the end of the chapter is a poem that David writes. It's also recorded in, in other places, but here it's recorded. It's a poem that we would call a funeral poem, a, a funeral dirge, actually, the proper word. A funeral dirge. A song, how much that he loved Saul and he loved Jonathan. So let's just read. It, it, it's read. I don't think I even made any notes for this. No, no, I just, I just want to read this to this poem here. And David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan, his son. Now here we have this in parentheses before he starts the poem. The writer of 2 Samuel says this. Also he bade them teach the children of Judah. Now if you notice in your Bible, if you have a King James, it says the use of the bow. Does, does the New American Standard say that, Jeremy? The use of the bow in verse 18? The song of the bow. The song of the bow. Much better. Brother Day, uh, Ray, what does verse 18 say in the NIV? In order that the men of Judah be taught this lamb of the bow, it is written in the book of Jashar. Okay, yes. So it's, but the King James, if you see those words are in italic, use of the bow. It's not the use of the bow, it's the song of the bow. It's teaching the slamitation, as, as the NIV says it. So they already know how to use bows. I mean, Jonathan was an expert with the bow. And many of the Israelites were great uh, uh, archers. So it's not saying teach them how to use a bow. He said, that's the name of the song named after Jonathan the bowman. He says, Teach them the song of the bow. And behold, it is written also in the book of Jasser. Now, I have a copy of the book of Jasser. Uh, it's, a, it's, not, it's not included in our Bibles. But the book of Jasher is an ancient book that has a lot of Bible stories in it. Has this has this poem in it. But you say, well, why is it not in the Bible? Because I hear some people say, it's the lost book of the Bible. No, it's not. All the Bible we're supposed to have that's anointed is in here, right here. It, we have the Bible right here. But when he mentions stuff like the book of Enoch that, uh, that uh, Peter mentions later on, then it's, he's, he just acknowledged that there is a book of Enoch out there, not that it's part of God's Word. And then what part he quoted, he said, now this part is true. And he quotes and says, the Lord will come with ten thousands of ten thousands to, to avenge his children. Talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. But it doesn't mean the whole book of Enoch is, is inspired. So the book of Jasher, a lot of fun to read. And, and I like reading it, but, uh, but it's not. I'm sure David had a better copy than me, though. But anyhow, here it is. Here's the song. And you just see the passion in this song. The beauty of Israel is slain upon the high places. How are the mighty fallen? That's the, that's the, that's the verse that's repeated in the song. Three times it says, how are the mighty fallen? This time, David's missing these two men. And you can feel the, how sad he is about them, but how much joy he has in their life, in their memory that they had. He calls them the beauty, the beauty. They were the divine appointed by God. Saul was God's first king of Israel. Head and shoulders and brought many blessings to the nation of Israel. In spite of his sins, God anointed him. Jonathan, his, his great son, 
that was also mighty. We were even read when Jonathan was a young man how that he and his armor bearer went and just started slaying, bringing victory over in God's hands. As, as Saul standing under a tree, don't know what to do, Jonathan and his young armor bearer remember going to attack the Philistines all by themselves. And God gives them a great victory. The beauty of Israel is slain upon the high place. How are the mighty fallen? Tell it not in Gath. Publish it not in the streets of Ascalon. Lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice. Now we, are, we know that it's already been told because we finished up. First Samuel was saying that some of his armor was taken to one city. Uh, some other part of his armor was taken to the other city. But, but he said, don't let the Philistines rejoice over this. Lest the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph. Then he talks to the mountains. Ye mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew. That's where Saul and Jonathan died. Let there be no dew, neither let there be rain upon you, nor the fields of offerings. For the shield of the mighty is vividly cast away. Vilely cast, excuse me, vilely cast away. The shield of Saul, as though he had not been anointed with oil. As though he had not been anointed with oil, but anointed with blood. He's talking about the shield, the shield of Saul. Was, must have been covered with blood, at least in David's picture in his mind. He's picturing David, Saul's, Saul's shield being covered with blood as he fought for the, for the nation of Israel against the Philistines just three days before this and died in the battle. Instead of being anointed with oil, which is Brother Jeremy, I think, mentioned Sunday morning when he was talking about the different armor took a couple Sundays ago they would have put oil on the leather so it would not crack and break as it was so before you go to battle you'd anoint your your uh, your shield from the blood of the slain from the fat of the mighty the bold of, of Jonathan turned not back brave and aggressive and the sword of Saul returned not empty they were great warriors for 40 years Saul had led the nation Saul and John's were lovely and pleasant in their lives. And in their death, they were not divided. Let me just stop right here. You remember, because you could say, well, they have been divided. Yes, Jonathan and Saul had had some arguments about Jonathan saying, Dad, you know that David is to be king, and I want to be part of his kingship. But I'll be loyal to you until that time, and his dad will become angry. Even through a spirit, Jonathan tried to kill him one time, remember? So Saul just had all these fits of anger and stuff in him. But don't forget that he was, he was God's man and God loved Saul. He turned away, I know that. But God had called him for a job and he very aptly had done that job. And they were not divided in their death. They died together that day. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. You daughters of Israel weep over Saul who clothed you in scarlet. With, and with other delights, prosperity and protection, because they were, they were 12 unorganized tribes, and King Saul brought them together as a nation. God bless that. Who put ornaments of gold upon your apparel. Here it is again. How are the mighty fallen in the midst of the battle? O Jonathan, thou wast slain in thy, in thy high places. I am distressed for thee, my brother Jonathan. Let me stop right there. You see, David did not only didn't try to kill Saul, when he had the chance. I'm going to go further than that. He actually respected Saul in lots of ways. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. If you persecute me for 15 minutes, I'll be mad at you. I might, it might take me a long time to even forgive you. But 15 months? And you send out assassins to kill you? 10 years? Maybe up to 15 years, some commentaries say, some say 12, but so over a decade. And yet David just has so much forgiveness for Saul. And he says, I love this man. I love Saul. I would have never killed him. I just waited for God to do his part. So not only did he not kill Saul, indeed, he didn't kill Saul in his heart either. You know, sometimes we'll get along with people and say, well, I'll forget forgive you, but I'll never forget. We know people say that, don't we, do? I'll forgive you, but I'll never forget. Well, then you really are still struggling with the forget. I'm not saying that you should forget what happened, but you got to forget it in the sense of it's not important anymore. 
You're forgiven in the sense that I'm going to hold it against you. Now this is quite a thing. You see why in spite of all of Saul's problems, Saul was a man after God's own heart. He had a ten, uh, David was David was a man after God's own heart. He had a tenderness even in his heart for Saul. How are the mighty fallen? I'm going to stop here and say this. The first time he uses that phrase, it's apparent that he's remembered Saul and these victories and stuff. The second time he says that, I think there's an honest question there. How are the mighty fallen? I'm going to say this, and I've heard some preaching on this too in my life. They just take this thought right here. How are the, how are the mighty fallen? I'll tell you how they fall. They fall a little bit at a time, Brother Danny. The mighty fall, Saul fell a little bit when he made the sacrifices when he didn't wait on Samuel that day, way back in the first three years of his reign. Fell a little bit more at another time when he was disobedient. Fell some more. In, so, so how do the mighty fall? fall the same way everybody else falls a little bit at a time. That's why in Sunday's message God said brethren if a man be overtaken in a fault it's uh, nobody means to fall into sin they think they can just flirt around with it and hang around with sin and it won't bother them and I'll just do a little bit of sin and guys it doesn't work that way. Sin has a way of growing in your heart. Sin has a way and I, I'm, I'm going to tell you particularly about one sin. Uh, this is not one of the sins I struggle with. I struggle with sins, but this is not one of the ones I do. But I know many Christian men that do. And I would never use their names. But I know many Christian men that struggle with pornography. And the best way I know to help you not be struggling with pornography is this. Find someone that you trust. Another man. Not a woman. Go to that person and say, can, well, can I be accountable to you? And then if someone comes to you like that, then you've got to be man enough to say from time to time. Or, or, or if it's a woman, because I think, Brother Jeremy, one, one thing that we heard at the men's conference, that the fastest growing segment of pornography was women mm -hmm. and 13 to 15 year old boys. Which kind of, But anyhow, so, so, so if it's a woman, you find another woman to talk to. And then you've got to be man or woman enough to say, how are you doing? This is true. Whether If you're someone that's helping someone with alcohol abuse or, or drugs and they've entrusted you to be their confidant, you can't just forget about them. You've got to call them up, get in your vehicle, go take them out for a cup of coffee or something or take some <laughs> coffee with you and say, hey, how are you doing this week? How long has it been? And, and just help people. How do the mighty fall? I'll say it this way, one click at a time. One click at a time, they start falling. Or one drink at a time. Or one join at a time. The mighty can fall so easily. Anyhow, man, so, so how are the mighty fallen? Oh, Jonathan, thou wast slain in thy high places. I am distressed for thee, my brother Jonathan. He's in anguish. The word distress there is a, is a hard Hebrew word that means anguish of a soul. My heart is broken. For thee, my brother Jonathan, very pleasant thou hast been unto me. Thy love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. Huh? How are the mighty fallen? And this time it's a sadness. And the weapons of war perished. Now I know that some people try to make something sickening out of where he says, the love, your love for me was greater than the love of women. That's not a sickening thing. It's a man thing. Saying, your love for me, I, I put it this way, I never was in the military. But Debbie's daddy was. And he faced, I don't know, if, I'll tell you, Debbie's daddy has three Purple Hearts, and we've got the medals. A bronze Star, they don't usually give those little low-life corporals. I, I'll tell you the story, but we can't deny how he got that Bronze Star. Her dad was a real hero. But when he came back from the war, Debbie, all the way from, we're talking like 1945, 1946, a long time before Debbie was born, but Debbie and him and the mom would go to, it was a Sophia, Debbie, y'all would go see his old war buddy. And he'd go see, all them years later, we're talking 20, 25, 30 years later, because evidently when you put your hand, your life in a man's hand, his life's in your hand, 
there's something big that ties you together. There's nothing sickening or homosexual or wicked about it. There's a love that you have. And so there's nothing sickening about this. This is the kind of love that Mousy had for his friend. His friend had for Mousy. The kind of love that doesn't die in a year or two. It's, you're saying, hey, you were there. You, you saved my life and I saved your life and all those sorts of things. So anyhow, and it came to pass after this that David inquired of the Lord saying, shall I go up into any of the cities of Judah? I like that. David doesn't say, all right, Saul's dead. I want to go try to be king now. No. He's saying, God, what do you want in my life? What do you want? Now, no doubt he's going to, he's, he's using, uh, remember the high priest Abathar is traveling with David, not with Saul. Saul killed many of the high priests. How sad that was early in, in the book of, of 1 Samuel. And Abathar alone escaped and joined himself with David. He's been with David now for many years. And he had the Urim and the Thurim. I don't know exactly how they would check with that, but he had the breastplate. He had, he had the, 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 the high priest's garments. So he's, he's asking of God, shall I go up to any of the cities? And evidently he got the answer, yes. <clears throat> All right. And the Lord said unto him, go up. And David said, Whither shall I go up? <laughs> and God he must have said, This city, that city, and I don't know how God did it, but through the priest, no doubt, God speaks to him and go to Hebron. And that's what he does. So David went up thither and his two wives, uh, Hanoam, the Jezreelites, and Abigail, Nabal's wife, the Carmelite. Now both of these wives were from that area. So that also, so they have family support there. Uh, I don't know why God chose. So I can tell you a few things about uh, about Hebron. I'm trying to remember some of them. Uh, Hebron is where Abraham came in the book of Genesis. And he built a great altar to God that was there for many years. He built an altar to worship Jehovah God there in the Canaanite area. And it was the town of Hebron. Hebron is the highest area, and still is, in all of Israel. It's the highest plateau. I, I did know the when we were there, they told us how high it was and everything, but it's the highest plateau in the old nation of Israel. And when Sarah died, when Abraham's wife Sarah died, he made his burial place there at Hebron. And then Abraham will be buried there. And Jacob will be buried there eventually when they come out of Egypt, when the old man is carried out of Egypt. Hundreds of years later, they'll bury Jacob there. So, so Hebron belongs to Caleb's family in the in the book of Joshua. Caleb says, "I want that mountain," and so he goes and kills all the giants that's there and conquers that mountain area. Big, not just one mountain, but the whole mountain area is given to Caleb. And so, uh, this is a great place, and God sends him to there, in, which is also in the middle of the tribe of Judah for his kingdom. For his first captain. So David went up thither and his men, his wives, and his men were with him, and, and his men that were with him did David bring up every man with his household, and they dwelt in the cities of Hebron. Actually, the word cities there is okay, but it's actually just the word small towns or villages, we'd say. So so it, you couldn't hardly bring 1,500 people into, into the town of Hebron, even though it is a big town without it, and all their cattle and sheep and everything and it without disturbance. So, so his men move into the villages all around Hebron, okay? So this is his first capital. And the men of Judah came, all the princes of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. So David was anointed by Samuel years and years and years before this. See, if he's been, let's just say he's been on the run for 12 years. That was from time, say, he was 20. He was anointed when he was, let's just say, when he was 12. So, wow, we're talking about 20 years before this or so. Samuel had anointed little David as the king of Israel. And now he's recognized by the whole tribe of Judah. And Abathar again anoints him as king over the house of Judah. And they told David, saying, that the men of Jabesh Gilead were they that buried Saul. And David is proud to hear that. At the very in the second year of Saul's reign, the first major battle that God ever gave Saul victory in was Jabesh Gilead, when they had been overtaken. And the king said, 
that uh, the Ammonites had come and said, I want to kill all of you, or if you be my servants, I'll put out your left eye. Remember that story we been months ago when we read it, but still. And they said, well, give us a few days. And when they get to take a few days, they sneak some spies out and get this word to Saul. And Saul gathers an army of over 100,000 and comes and saves them in all the area. So these men of Jabesh Gilead go and take the body of Saul. David sent messengers unto the men of Jabesh Gilead and said unto them, Blessed be ye of the Lord, that ye have showed this kindness unto your Lord, even unto Saul, and have buried him. And now the Lord show kindness and truth unto you. And I will also requite, request this of you, this kindness, because you have done this, you have, because you have done this thing. So I want to repay you. I'm requesting. Here's his request. Therefore now let your heads be strengthened. Be ye valiant. For your master Saul is dead, and the house of Judah hath anointed me king over them. So David has two things in mind. To say thank you to these men who rescue Saul's body and all, all four of his sons that died with him, Jonathan and uh, three others, and take their bodies and, well, let's just turn back with them. Let me just read to you. It'll be faster reading it than it will be said. Turn back to the main end of, of 1 Samuel chapter 31, verse 10. Okay, this is the end of the last four verses here of the book. After this battle, the Philistines, chapter 31, verse 10, about three, four pages back. And they put his armor in the house of Asheroth, more their false gods, and fastened his body to the wall of Bethshane. Debbie and I have been there to the Roman city of Bethshane, and you can look up on the hill. And it's marked where Saul and his sons were hung there on the wall. Huh. And when the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead heard of that, which the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and went all night and took the body of Saul. And this is they going right into the Philistine camp. Now it's in Israeli territory, but they're going to take back the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Bethshane. They came to Jabesh and burnt them there so they could no longer be dug up and be mistreated. And they took their bones and buried them under a tree at Jabesh fasted seven days. No one was allowed to eat for seven days, not even their cattle, if you understand this. And so David said, thank you for your kindness, your braveness, but I'd like for you now to pledge your allegiance to me. Well, that's not what happens. When you're going right along with some good stuff, chapter 2, David's anointed as king, he's praising the men of Jabesh Gilead, the great big beautiful song about Saul and David. When you find a butt there, that means everything's about to change. All the happiness of this beautiful poem and God anointed them and they're moving to Hebron and being anointed as king. But Abner, the son of Ner, captain of Saul's host, took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahem. Now, listen. This is the last son of Saul that's left alive. And you say, why didn't he go to battle with Saul? I don't know. Maybe Saul left him behind in case that the battle went bad and one of his, maybe one of his sons always stayed behind. But I do know what Ishbosheth means. It means son of shame. <laughs> so that's not a very cool name. Of all the names you could, you'd hate for your dad to look down on you and say, I'm ashamed of that. And that's your name from then on out. I'm ashamed of that one right there. About as bad as me named Rufus. No offense to any of y'all that has an uncle Rufus, okay? But anyhow, what's he look? He looked like top of the house, anyhow. So, uh, but that's his name. Son of shame. Saul's captain, Abner, is Saul's also first cousin. Ner is Saul's dad's brother, okay? So Abner's his cousin. Abner was embarrassed by David. And so he takes Saul's son, he know, and he knows but He knows the same thing as Saul knew, that God had anointed David to be king of Israel. But in spite of this, he still, he still wants to go against God, rebel against God. He doesn't want to lose his position as a, as a head of the army. I don't know that he would have. 
I mean, David would be kind of silly not to incorporate him into his command because he's a great warrior. And so, uh, but anyhow, he goes against God just like Saul had already done. And he anoints uh, Saul's son, son of shame, as king. And made him king over Gilead. There, Jabesh Gilead. That's the area, but it's in, not in that city. Not in Jabesh, but in, in Mahanim. Mahanim. And over the Asherites, that's one of the twelve tribes, and over Jezreel, and over Ephraim, and over Benjamin, and over all Israel. Now, this takes years. It's going to take years for this to happen because they don't want him to be their king. The other tribes basically don't want anybody to be their king. You'll, you'll we'll see this later. But, so, but eventually Abner wins enough victories over the Philistines and stuff to get them some freedom. Maybe they, they don't have complete freedom. But at least they were like in the days of Jonathan and Saul. They were able to have a small army and pay taxes and stuff to the Philistines. But they had some kind of freedom. Ishmael, Saul's son, was Ishmosheth. Saul's son was 40 years old when he began to reign over Israel. And he reigned two years. Now he only reigned two years. But the house of Judah followed David. And the time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. So evidently it must take five and a half years. For Abner to consolidate enough people. So he, he calls him the king over Israel to begin with. But at first he's only a king over a handful of cities. And then finally the, over the tribe of Asher. So it takes time. And so he's really only king for two years. Let's get started on this next little part. I, I th told you, Jeremy, we'd quit at verse 11. But let's go ahead and read a little bit more. And Abner, the son of Ner, the servant of Ishmael, the son of Saul, went from Menanim. To Gibeah. Now he's going to, he's got his kind of his power consolidated. So now he's going to go out and try to face David's army. And Joab, the son of Zerah, that's David's sister, Zerah. So Joab is David's nephew. And the servants of David went out. This is the first time we've seen, but we'll see Joab many more times. This is also the main character in this book is, is David, but Joab will be seen throughout this book not usually in a good light. Except for in war, he's always seen in a good light because he is a great, like, I mean, like, you re we'll read some of the stuff that Joab does, you say, if that wasn't in the Bible, I wouldn't believe that. I mean, it's just, he's just such a mighty man. He, it's like you could drop him down into a field surrounded by 50 men and he kills them all. I mean, it, it, we'll read about it. And you'll see he's just something else. But it's David's nephew. And the servants of David went out and met together by the pool of Gibeon. It's actually a big cistern. It's a big flat area good for battle. And they sat down on one side of the pool. Okay, one side of the area. And the, and, and the other on the other side. So you got uh, Ishbosheth's army under Abner on one side. David's army under uh, Joab on the other side. Joab's got a cool name, by the way. His name means my father is Jehovah. That's a cool name, isn't it? So Zerah gives her son a good name. And Abner said to Joab, let the young men now arise and play before us. And Joab said, let them arise. In other words, instead of us put the whole battle together, several hundred men fighting, Let's just take, choose, you choose your 12 good warriors, I'll choose 12 good warriors, and we'll let them fight. But here's what happens. And there arose and went over by the number 12 of Benjamin, that's the Ishbosheth's army, which pertained unto Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and 12 of the servants of David. And here's where it gets a little bit confusing. And they caught every one his fellow by the head, and thrust in his fellow's side, so they fell together. Wherefore, the name of the place is called Helkath Hazarim. I'm just going to say, okay, corral, okay? Because <laughs> it, it, it means the place of sharp swords. Right? The place of sharp swords, or, or the place of, of, uh, of fallen men, okay? So it's kind of a strange Hebrew word. Okay, now here's where it gets a little, so is, he, is, is, is the writer of Samuel saying that the twelve men of David, because that could be, and they, because they is the last one to mention our service of David, called everyone his fellow, 
and slay them? Or is he saying that all 24 of them fight until they're all dead? I don't know. But either way, it's a terrible thing to see these young men give up their lives. And so, that didn't settle anything. And there was a very sore battle that day. And Abner was beaten. And the men of Israel before the service of David. And there were three sons of Zariah. We know one of them already, Joab. There, Joab, Jehovah's my father. Abishai, the one that went with David into the camp of Saul that night. His name is, it's really weird. David's dad, Jesse. Jesse means a gift, okay? So, Abishai actually means, my father is Jesse, named in honor of his grandfather. You know, like you'd say, uh, well, like, Ray and Patsy's little granddaughter Bailey. I mean, she's named Bailey because of her last name's not Bailey. Okay, you know, so it's an honorable thing, or it could just mean my father sees me as a gift. And then there's Ashiel. Ashiel means made by God. He is some kind of athlete. I mean, he is the kind of guy. If he was playing, he'd be the basketball star, the football star. He'd be like Kurt Warner was at Pineville years ago. He'd be the all star in every sport. Okay. He was light of foot as a wild girl, as a gazelle. He was just fast as Greece, lightning, athletic. All, all of the sons are athletic. But. And Ashiel pursued after Abner. And in going, he turned not to the right hand or to the left from following Abner. And Abner looked behind him and said, Are thou Ashiel? And he said, I am. And Abner said to him, Turn thee aside to thy right hand or left hand and lay hold on one of the young men of my army, one of the young men, and take his armor. You know, it was kill him. But Ashiel would not turn aside from following him. And Abner said again to Ashiel, Turn thee aside from following me. Wherefore should I smite thee to the ground? How should I hold my face up to Joab thy brother? Because Ashiel's young, but Joab and Abner, Joab has been under Abner's command. So Abner knows in time past, before the split between David's family and Saul's family, what a, what a warrior that Joab is and, and, and how much he, he thinks of Joab and and he said, I, can, I don't want to kill you, boy. I don't want to kill you. And I'm an experienced warrior. Do not do this. Howbeit he refused to turn aside. Well, wherefore Abner, with the hindered end of the spear, the, the non sharp end, but sharp enough to shove it, just sharpen the wood that hold it into the ground, smote him under the fifth rib that the spear came out behind him. And that's quite. Abner is quite a, a strong man, isn't he? Ashiel is running after him, and he's begging him several times to leave him alone, and he won't. So he turns and just thrusts in one thrust. Of course, I realize Ashiel is running, not to sharp end of the spear, but to duel end. goes all the way through him and comes out his back. That's a pretty powerful lick. Whew. War is not good. I mean, it has to be had, but I'm just saying it's not... It, it's, it's, it's an ugly thing. And he died in the same place and it came to pass that many as came to the place where Ashiel fell down and died stood still. And Joab also and Abishai, the other two brothers, pursued after Abner and the sun went down and they were come to the hill of Ammah that lieth before Gael in the way of the wilderness of Gibeon. And the children of Benjamin gathered themselves together after Abner so they finally the battle's coming toward the evening, and so Abner's able to gather what part of his army is left. They become one troop, and they stand at the top of the hill, have the high ground. And Abner calls to Joab and says, Shall the sword devour forever? Has it not eaten enough today? Knowest thou not it will be bitterness in the latter end? How long shall it be then, ere thou bid the people return from following their brethren? See, but Abner had started this. Abner was the one that invaded David. <coughs> Abner was the one that said, let them play. Abner has nobody to blame but himself. I know he didn't want to kill, but still. Joab said, as God lives, unless that spoken surely in the morning, the people had gone every, up every one from following his brother. In other words, before it's over, we killed all of you. Now, I'll pick up in verse 28, the Lord willing, next week. But I'm going to go down and let you see how bad the battle was. Verse 30. And Joab returned from following Abner 
And he gathered all the people together. They're elect of David's servants, 19 men in Ashiel. So 20 men. If there are 12 of them died at the, if there were 12 of them died at the first little battle, that means they had lost only seven other men. But the servants of David had smitten of Benjamin and of Abner's men so that 360 men died. It was a one-sided battle is what I'm saying. Completely one-sided. And we'll pick up there, Lord's willing, next week. Lessons for us to learn tonight is this, very simply. Don't lift your hand against God's anointed. You see a brother or sister, that's God's anointed. They've been saved by the blood of Jesus. You say, well, I, I don't respect what they're doing. I can understand that. But pray for them. Lift them up. Talk to them. Love them. Care for them. Restore them. But don't feel like it's your place that you've got to bring down God's anointing. Let God take care of that business. Let God do that. And if you lie, you might end up with your head cut off <laughs> like that uh, Amalekite did. All right. Let's uh, dismiss him. Pray. Father, we do love you. We praise you. Thank you for your word. How powerful that it is. And these hero stories we read, Lord God, that they just inspire us as examples that we would also want to be mighty for you. In Jesus' name.